Um, Secretary General, thank you so much for joining uh, us at HFX 2020. Um, uh, there are a number of issues to discuss. One of them, of course, has been in the news this week. Um, and, and this, of course, is the administration has been talking about a drawdown uh, in Afghanistan. I mean, not altogether surprising, not altogether difficult to understand after we've been there for 20 years. Um, but you've expressed some concerns uh, about drawing down too fast and, uh, you know, a potential rise of, of Islamic State uh, and associated terror groups. Uh, have you been able to get further clarification from the White House in the last couple of days on that? Well, the U.S. position is clear, uh, and they are going to uh, reduce their presence in uh, Afghanistan from roughly 4,500 to around uh, uh, 2,500 to 2,500 uh, troops. Um, uh, no NATO ally would like to stay in Afghanistan uh, longer than uh, necessary. At the same time, if we leave too early, if we leave too hasty, uh, we may risk to to lose all the gains we have made and uh, and uh, and that's a risky project so uh, so uh, what is clear now is that uh, the us is going to reduce but they're not going to leave uh, the us will continue to provide support to the other nato allies and we have to remember that uh, more 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 than half of the troops in afghanistan now uh, are non-us uh, they are european allies and also partner nations um, uh, we are in Afghanistan to make sure that Afghanistan never again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists, the, a platform where terrorists can plan, organize, uh, finance, um, launch terrorist attacks against our countries. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we strongly support the, the, the peace talks which are taking place between Taliban and the government. And part of the agreement between U.S. and Taliban is that all international troops should be out by the 1st of May next year. So early next year, we need to make a very hard decision. Um, that's whether we leave and risk to lose the gains we have made, uh, but then at least we can be out of Afghanistan, uh, or whether we stay uh, and, uh, and then uh, continue to be involved in a very challenging and demanding military operation uh, in Afghanistan. My message is that we need to assess whether the conditions for leaving are met together. Uh, we need to make these decisions together. Uh, and as we have said many times in, in NATO, we went into Afghanistan together. Uh, we should make decisions on uh, adjustments of our presence there together. And when the time is right, uh, we should leave together, but then in a coordinated and orderly way. As ever in, in anything to do with Afghanistan, there are, there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, one of those moving parts, of course, is a, a transfer of power here in the United States. Uh, have you been in touch with President-elect Biden and or his team? I have congratulated uh, President-elect uh, Joe uh, Biden. I also congratulated uh, President -elect, the, the Vice President-elect uh, uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, uh, and I know B Joe Biden as a strong supporter of uh, NATO, of, uh, of the transatlantic bond, the cooperation between North America and, uh, and Europe. Uh, and I have had the pri privilege of working with him in his previous capacity as Vice President. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with uh, him. Um, uh, my team is in contact with his team. Uh, at the same time, we are much aware of that uh, in the United States, as in all of our countries, there's only one president at a time. So we work with the current administration. Uh, uh, I've been in close contact with them now, uh, as they have decided to uh, adjust their presence in, in Afghanistan. And then I'm looking forward to work with a, a new Biden administration uh, after inauguration on the 20th of January. I mean, after the accession of North Macedonia, there are now 30 member uh, nations uh, in NATO. Uh, and as you, you, you mentioned a few moments ago, um, a, a, a significant proportion of the, of the troops uh, in Afghanistan are not American. I mean, if the United States um, draws down um, to a level that you as Secretary General feel um, is, is, is uh, risky, uh, uh, it's hard to find the right words here. Uh, I mean, what about the other 29 nations? Can't they put in a few more troops to hold the line? I think we have to remember why we went into Afghanistan. Uh, we went into Afghanistan um, after an attack on the United States. And that's the reason why we all have been there for almost 20 years. And, uh, and uh, more than 1,000 non-US soldiers have paid the highest price, the ultimate price. 
and and us of course and but also nato allies and partners have paid a high price in in, in blood and treasure for our uh, presence in Afghanistan. We have achieved uh, the most important thing, and that is to prevent Afghanistan from being a safe haven for international terrorists. Uh, but at the same time, we would like to leave when uh, the conditions are uh, right. And that's exactly what we're going to assess together uh, early next year, and then make decisions together on whether to stay or whether uh, to leave. Uh, and I'm absolutely certain that we will then do that uh, all allies, of course, including the United States. Uh, moving to, uh, to to the bigger international picture, um, let's talk a little bit about China. Um, China is a rising power. Uh, no one doubts that. No one disputes there's any reason why it shouldn't be a rising power, uh, that its, a, it's, a, its economy will overtake the United States at some point, probably towards the, the end of this decade. It is obviously increasing its military expenditure. Um, to what extent does China pose a strategic challenge uh, to NATO? So China is not an enemy. China is not, not an adversary. Uh, but of course, the rise of China has implications for uh, NATO and NATO allies. Uh, there are huge opportunities, not least economic opportunities. Uh, China is a big, growing economy. Uh, it provides markets for all NATO uh, uh, allies, and it has actually hel helped to fuel economic growth also in NATO countries. But at the same time, there are some challenges. Uh, uh, China already has the second largest defense budget in the world. They are investing heavily in new modern uh, capabilities, including nuclear capabilities, uh, missiles which can reach uh, all NATO uh, uh, countries. Um, maritime ca capabilities, uh, and we also see that China is a country which is not which doesn't share our values, democracy, the rule of law, in the way we believe in it uh, in uh, in uh, in NATO. We have seen that when it comes to, for instance, the way they uh, they 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 deal with Hong Kong, uh, undermining the democratic rights of people living there, uh, Uyghurs, minorities, but we're also seeing it in the way China tries to coerce. Um, intimidate neighbors, um, um, both in the region, the South China Sea, uh, but also, for instance, how they try to punish uh, Australia uh, for uh, raising some issues about uh, the coronavirus or my own country. Uh, the, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded a peace prize to, the, to, uh, to a Chinese dissident some years ago. And then for many, many years, the China tried to actually to force NATO to to, uh, to, to express a public excuse for that decision. So, so all of this is, of course, a challenge. And for me, that uh, just makes NATO more important uh, uh, because, uh, because when we stand together, uh, all NATO allies, uh, we are 50% of the world's GDP, 50% of the world's uh, military power, and size matters, especially when you discuss the consequences of the rise of China. Yeah, but we actually put out a, a handbook for democracies on China this week. I don't know whether you, you've had a chance to look at it, but uh, and I actually mentioned as the author of that uh, that handbook uh, the Norwegian case, which is interesting. And to me, it highlighted. It's very easy to blame Norway, and, and to a certain extent, what you know, Norway is a democracy and has to accept criticism like any other democracy. And yet, to me, the important issue was the lack of solidarity. Uh, I mean, it's very easy to blame one European country for not standing up to this enormous uh, behemoth in China. Um, but unless we actually stand together, uh, then China is going to essentially assert its will over, over individual nations. I mean, to what extent is there unity within NATO about China? So we have just launched a project which we call NATO 2030, which is about the future of NATO. And that project uh, uh, will, of course, address many different issues. But one of the issues we have to address uh, is uh, the consequences of uh, the rise of uh, China. Uh, and I strongly believe that, uh, if anything, the rise of China just makes NATO more important and unity among NATO allies more important. Um, uh, and this is not only about, you know, the military challenges, uh, uh, but also about cyber. It's about resilience of our, of our uh, infrastructure, telecommunication, where we see China is investing heavily. And it's also about standing together when we stand up for our uh, values. And I think we all have uh, some lessons to, to learn 
uh, and I was prime minister at that time in Norway when 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 China tried to force us to uh, to give in. Um, we were able to stand up against that pressure, but but it is hard, uh, and it's hard when China uh, picks one by one. So therefore, if anything, I believe that NATO should become an even stronger political platform for 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 uniting uh, allies, but also partners. Uh, to stand up when China tries to coerce, to force upon them a policy or or or, or force them to do th something which is against their uh, interests. Um, and therefore, we're also uh, working more and more closely with our uh, partners in the Asia-Pacific. I, I have recently visited uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, all partners of NATO, and they all expressed a strong will to work more closely with NATO, and we are ready to do so. It's interesting, uh, and your last points are very much in line with what I was just going to ask you, which is that it seems that the, the rise of China has concentrated minds. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say that we were complacent uh, for 30 years after the end of the Cold War, but, but there was a certain... Uh, which element of wishful thinking about China. There was a belief that uh, capitalist economics would inevitably lead to, to political democracy, and plainly uh, that simply hasn't happened. Uh, and NATO is, is, is staying in the Euro-Atlantic region uh, as an organization. You're not looking for members out in Asia or the Indo-Pacific region. Um, but please just talk a little bit more about the cooperation between democracies um, uh, that, that NATO is an integral part of. Because re it seems to me that reimagining alliances between democracies for the 21st century, rather than embedding ourselves in the thinking of the 20th century, is really the way to go. So I wonder what your, your thoughts are on that. NATO is a regional alliance, uh, North America and the Europe, uh, and we should remain a regional alliance. At the same time, NATO as a regional alliance needs a more global approach uh, because uh, so many of the challenges, uh, threats we face are more and more global. Terrorism, cyber, space, hybrid warfare, proliferation of nuclear weapons, and then uh, the rise of China are all global challenges that matters for all NATO allies. So I think it's absolutely possible for NATO to remain a, a regional uh, organization, but at the same time work more and more closely with uh, like-minded countries all over the world, but including in the Asia Pacific region. And I strongly believe that democracies of the world should stand together. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, we saw uh, some decades where more and more countries became democratic, more and more people lived in democratic societies. Now we have seen actually the, the trend shifting a bit in the wrong direction. So uh, uh, that uh, makes it even more important that countries that believe in democracy, in the rule of law, have to stand together, especially when we see pressure from outside, from countries that doesn't share or don't share our uh, values, uh, like, for instance, uh, China. A final question, um, Secretary General, coming back to NATO. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, a, a little earlier in this uh, discussion that uh, North Macedonia had joined NATO, bringing uh, the number to 30. Uh, there is still this sense that it's a, it's a, it's a healthy and expanding alliance. Uh, one of the criticisms, which, which you'll be very well aware of, and I'm sure quite sympathetic towards, uh, at, at least privately, um, from the American side, is that NATO countries have not been spending enough on defence. But since uh, the Cardiff summit in 2014, uh, there has been progress, hasn't there? Could you just give us a sense of where we are in terms of the uh, the recommended 2% of, it's not a requirement, the recommendation uh, to spend 2% of GDP and where you see things going in the next few years? So first of all, I welcome the fact that NATO's door is open and that we now have uh, a new member, uh, North Macedonia, and uh, uh, the Defence Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Radmila Sekinska, she's really a, a great uh, 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 so ambassador for, for her country. Uh, she used to be the deputy prime minister. I don't think she's that anymore, but at least she's the, uh, the minister of defense and she, she, uh, she um, will participate in the Halifax uh, forum. And I think that's just uh, one way of, uh, of demonstrating the importance of uh, a NATO ally, North Macedonia. Uh, then on burden sharing, um, uh, that's an area where actually we have made significant progress. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, we are where we should be, but we are in a much better place than where we were just a few years ago. Um, because since we made the decision back in 2014, 
uh, uh, about uh, spending more on defense, uh, fair burden sharing, all uh, NATO allies across Europe and Canada have increased. Uh, more NATO allies meet the guideline of spending 2% of GDP uh, on defense, and the majority have plans in place uh, to, uh, to spend 2%. And, uh, and just over the last years, so we have added uh, 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 so significant tens of uh, billions of dollars uh, uh, to our defense uh, spending of uh, to, to our budget. So, 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 so that's uh, good news, uh, mainly because it shows that NATO actually, um, uh, we are 30 allies which are committed, and when we decide something, we're able uh, to deliver, and, uh, and uh, that's exactly what we've done over the last years. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, thank you so much for joining us at HFX 2020. Thank you so much for having me.